Hello. We're used to finding dedicatory inscriptions in our churches, usually on monuments and memorials. But if we look a bit closer, we'll find that there are other medieval inscriptions to be discovered. In some churches, dedication stones survive. This is the dedication stone at Warnford in Hampshire, dating from the 12th century and marking the foundation of the church, probably by Adam de Port. At North Crawley in Buckinghamshire, this stone records the rebuilding of the chancel by Peter Winton in 1294. This not only marks a moment in time, but literally sets in stone the name of the donor whose name might not otherwise be remembered. During the 15th century, dedicatory inscriptions were becoming more and more common. Churches were being enlarged or rebuilt, and the donors hoped that their munificence would assist their soul on its journey to heaven. They wanted the living to pray for them. And what better way than to leave a permanent link that would remind people of their gift for the lifetime of that building? At Hesed in Suffolk, the North Chapel carries an external inscription that tells us that John Hu and his wife paid for this extension to the church, who died in 1492. He was not the first member of the family to be remembered in this way, as inside the church, the font carries an inscription on its pedestal, telling us that it was the gift of Robert Hu in 1451 and asking for our prayers. Donors would traditionally be from armidurous families, those with shields of arms, which could be displayed as a remembrance of their generosity, as we find here at Beeston Next Milam in Norfolk, or occasionally by a rebus or play on their name. Here is the Goldwell rebus in stained glass at Great Chart in Kent. Increasingly, the merchant classes were becoming donors, so without a shield of arms to display, it had to be their name or initials. Here at Rayleigh in Essex, Roger Smith obviously paid for this pier in the nave arcade. Rebuilding the nave of a church would quite frequently be a communal effort, with each pier being paid for by a single donor, or slightly more at Beverley in Yorkshire, where this inscription records two pillars and a half. We find these communal dedications outside as well, usually on the dressed stone on corners or on buttresses. At Bradfield St George, John Bacon died in 1513, leaving money to the construction of the tower. And at Santon Downham, John Watts, John Reeve and others left money in their wills at about the same time. Church furnishings too became popular gifts by individuals or groups of individuals. This lectern, made in East Anglia in the early 16th century and at Oxborough in Norfolk, bears the name of its donor, Thomas Kipping. All pre-Reformation churches were divided internally by a rude screen. And as the most important structure in the nave, these were the focus of special devotion by the parishioners. Many retain painted or inscribed inscriptions, including at Wigan Hall, St Mary the Virgin, where these two panels depicting female saints were given by Thomas Lacey and Humphrey Kerville, whose names can be found at the base. At Western Longville, the inscription is across the Bresima. The 16th century brought seats into our churches on a massive scale and two Norfolk churches have examples with named donors. The first one is at Wickmere, which retains its original colouring and records the gift of three individuals. And here at Borbra, Robert Pryke was the single donor. After the Reformation, when we stopped praying for the souls of the departed, it didn't mean a stop to inscriptions but now they would be of church wardens who repaired or beautified churches and the initials solely remind us of their contribution and their standing in society. Like these bell openings at Frampton upon Severn in Gloucestershire. We always associate the medieval period with its fantastic art. 
its work in stained glass, in stone and wood. But plain inscriptions can be just as fascinating and I hope that I've encouraged you to have a look for inscriptions when visiting our medieval churches.